Uh, Housing Commission, and I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. It is uh, 5.05, and we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, roll call. Dr. Paul Funakua. Robert Abraham. Present. Jessica Guerrero. Here. Marianne Kestenbaum. Here. Keith Holm. Here. John Kenny. David Nisibocha. Here. Sarah Sanchez. Lourdes Castro Reyes. Ramirez. Here. Ramirez, sorry. That's all right. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda, uh, I would like to uh, go ahead and uh, go through the public sign in uh, sheet. Um, I do have a few individuals that have signed in, um, and one individual, one citizen that has asked to speak to the commission. Um, but I'm going to go through each name, and as I call your name, if you would like to address the commission, please let us know. The first person is uh, Rich Acosta. Thank you. Second person here is um, H. Davila. Am I pronouncing the name correctly? Not speaking. Davila. Okay. Press. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Uh, next is uh, Maureen Galindo, and uh, you are signed to speak. Okay, you have three minutes if you oh, like right. to go. Yes. Uh, you can wait until the end, but we normally uh, would we would like to hear from citizens okay. at the start of so that as we go into the presentation of the item and discussion among the commission, we have an opportunity to consider your input. Okay. I was going to consider all We'd like to hear from you. Okay. Okay. Um, this is an awkward space. Um, my name is Maureen Galindo. I live at uh, Sedbrook's Apartments. Um, moved in there two August ago. That day I moved in, I that I would be getting displaced here soon because of the San Pedro Cruz construction. Um, organized tenants, I think a lot of people kind of already know the gist about what happened there. Um, what people may not know is that nobody really ever got um, good support. The people who we were able to contact with and, you know, retain uh, relationships with and make sure that we gave them the information to go to the city to get relocation funds did mostly get that but overall most people there never received information about the city you know if it did come they didn't really um, have enough information to go get the support that they needed and so there's still many many people there I just drove through today and you know I was driving through the parking lot and asked a guy because I always ask everybody I'm like hey how's everything going here and he's like Man, I'm moving. My rent's gone up three hundred dollars in the past year and a half. I live in an efficiency apartment. My neighbors are moving. Their rent has gone up. Like the management is really awful to us, and like nobody's really getting the support that they need that the city should be addressing with the big deal that SoFworks became over the past year. Um, and so we've been trying to work with the neighborhood housing um, services development to. What, what should have been done, this risk mitigation policy should have been created with the input of SoapWorks tenants. Rather than having meetings outside of that scope and break, like inviting all of these advocates, it should have been going to people who are being displaced um, in order to get real life data on what displacement is actually like. And so the way that it is right now, there's way too many people who aren't going to be protected. Um, and so to follow that, what I really think needs to be done is that this needs to be tested on the SoapWorks tenants um, so that everybody there does relocate securely. And at the same time that we talk to them and get information on what displacement actually looks like. Because how can we create a displacement mitigation policy or prevention or anything? How can we talk about displacement if we don't know what it looks like? And we don't know what it looks like. We don't know what it is. Um, and that's very, very clear and obvious, by the way, that um, what kind of came out of this. And so I would love to you know, promote here that the city, the department, goes to SoapWorks and holds meetings there, a few meetings, not just one, because with one, then people come, and this is what happened when there was a, when we invited Councilman to DL to SoapWorks. People came, they heard kind of that, they, that the city wanted to help, but that there wasn't really, I mean, quite honestly, they, they felt like it was BS and they didn't want to help. Um, and so a couple meetings to make sure that the process is really thorough and that people get the relocation funds that they need in the way that they need it when they want to move. And at the same time, through those couple meetings, 
getting information on the emotional cost of displacement, on the medical cost. You know what it says, there's people who have had strokes and so forth, and who have to go to the doctor for high blood pressure because of the stress of losing their homes and their communities. Um, but the economic costs, and not just having to move all of your stuff from one place to the next, but the, the um, stress that that causes on the body, and reimbursing everybody for that. This is a city-sponsored displacement that happened at SOFWORKS, and so we need to make sure that we actually do the work to help all of those people move, and then with that information that we get about displacement, make sure that we help everybody else in San Antonio in a way that like, authentically um, considers their experience. much for fitting me in at the last minute. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some concerns that I have about this risk mitigation policy. Um, in looking at other cities and what other cities have, have kind of done to protect tenants in these situations, I noticed that San Antonio's policy seems to kind of lack any consequences for landlords who decide not to participate in it. Um, landlord participation in a program like this that's intended to help people who are being displaced it should be a requirement, it shouldn't be a suggestion or an opt-in situation. And if I'm understanding correctly, which I may not be, it seems like this is giving the landlords the option. So I know we don't have a lot of control over what private uh, actors decide to do, but in other cities they've found ways to attach, I'm sorry, I just got here on my bike, um, to attach this to uh, things like, uh, to things that the landlord is requesting from the city things like a zoning change, things like a request for a demolition or alteration of the existing multifamily building, a condo conversion, a land use change, um, even a request, of course, for city funding or tax increment financing money. Um, in Austin, for example, the policy is triggered, and I think you all know this, uh, at NHSD they spoke to the city of Austin, um, a request for rezoning by the landlord uh, or a discretionary land use approval by council, or also if the landlord wants to demolish a multifamily building, that would trigger they have to participate in this. So it makes me wonder, and I'd, I'd like to hear from NHSD about this, why didn't San Antonio decide to link a landlord participation requirement to these kinds of requests? So where we do have power as a city, why don't we take it? Why do we put the onus on the landlord to come and do this without giving the city uh, any power to push them to do it? Um, the other thing I want to know is, is there a legitimate reason why the city isn't requiring a landlord to contribute funds to this program? Why should the city, all of us, be left holding the responsibility for landlords who end up displacing tenants? So those are two things I'd really like to hear about today. Um, thanks so much for giving me time to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we also have uh, Christina. Uh, Christina, you're going did you like to check off that I wanted to speak? Did no, you did not uh, check it off, and I'm, I'm just asking if you would like to address the commission. Absolutely. I, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. We have three minutes. Okay. Up to three minutes, I should say. Hi, I'm Jose Pasatera in Flournoy. I work for the Elmore Area Council of Government and the Aging and Disability Resource Center. I'm the Regional Housing Navigator under a collaborative agreement between HUD and Health and Human Services to do what we can to support uh, special populations, particularly those that we serve. And I just wanted to say that um, while it's been quite a long time that we've been working through this process, um, it's given me an opportunity to see how um, you know, we have engaged the challenge before us. And while I you know, know that there are still many things that we can do to continue to serve our special populations, but in effect, all citizens in San Antonio wanted to say thank you for the efforts over the past 16 or so months that we've been engaged in this process. Um, and as I'm looking through this draft, um, 
I see that you have, in fact, acknowledged that seniors and individuals with disabilities um, do um, oftentimes are, uh, have challenges or are presented with challenges that, in effect, um, create an additional financial burden as they're um, engaging of their own relocation process or effort. And so I just wanted to take a few moments to say that while I know that there's still much work to be done and I am um, looking forward to continuing to engage in all those processes, I did want to say thank you for, for um, taking um, you know, the time to seriously consider the input that I have offered in the past to have you consider the additional uh, struggles, obstacles, and financial needs of um, the aging population and folks with disabilities. So thank you again for that. Citizen uh, comment period. And so the, the one item that we have on the agenda, this is a special meeting of the Housing Commission. The one item that we have on the agenda is uh, a presentation by city staff uh, on the risk mitigation policy for the city of San Antonio. So at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Michael Rodriguez with the Neighborhood and Housing Services Department and the director also of the Neighborhood and Housing Services Department, Veronica Casola. Thank you. Good afternoon, Veronica Soto with the Neighborhood and Housing Services Department. Um, so we have been um, talking about the risk mitigation policy um, even before our budget was adopted. And I have to say there is certainly a high level of interest in this. Um, and so I'll go through a presentation to uh, talk and brief you on where we're at. Um, this is a special meeting of the Housing Commission. Um, since you were uh, reconvened and appointed, all the work uh, has happened before that event. And so um, you had not seen the policy before you got appointed to this. The work on the policy started um, actually in the conversations that uh, led to the creation of the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. Um, and I have to say that the Mayor continues to be engaged in these conversations because uh, just today he sent uh, an email reminding um, my boss, Peter Sinoni, the PC manager, and, and I um, of the framework uh, charge that we were supposed to develop a compassionate and com comprehensive uh, framework to address affordable housing and he stressed um, the compassionate part of that and that as we move forward with this policy we not lose sight of that and so I, I do want to share that um, because he, he continues to be engaged in the work with affordable housing he sent us that reminder note that this is about making sure that we address those um, who um, have the most need, the vulnerable communities, that we not lose sight that we want to help families, regardless of income, to have safe, affordable, stable housing. And this is one of the elements by which we can attempt to achieve that. Is this the answer for all of that? No, this is one piece for that. And so I will not go through a presentation um, to start uh, briefing you on the housing policy uh, work. Um, and so, again, as I mentioned, this really came as a result of the housing policy framework adoption. Um, there were a lot of conversations, um, really ground up uh, community input that shaped the final report. And included in this report was recognition that we needed to address those with need who were facing imminent displacement. It was part of our three-year business plan we put that we would have um, how to utilize this uh, fund set aside this year as a deliverable. So this fiscal year, we had to give you a policy for how to utilize the funding that was approved by City Council. Um, and the allocation this fiscal year is $1 million for the risk mitigation fund. Um, and as I mentioned, this is one piece of a larger uh, puzzle, really, um, there are people who are facing this condition now, as you heard. Um, and so those folks that now need assistance need to be able, you know, we need to be able to mitigate that. Uh, but this is not the only thing that 
can address those issues. So we're looking at relocation assistance for those families who may be facing that difficult uh, situation. We need to be able to also offer emergency assistance. But there's a lot of things that can help us prevent displacement overall. This is one piece of a larger puzzle. Uh, we have to have places to help people move into, or we have to create more affordable housing. So we have to have enough affordable housing, either preserving or creating new. That's one way in which we can help families by having enough housing stock that is affordable in our community. We have to be able to make sure that uh, we address current existing affordable housing because in the conversations with the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, um, the phrase, the most affordable home, or the most affordable housing is existing housing now. So how do we educate our residents so they can retain their homes? How do we let them know of the tax exemptions and preservation tools that are available now so that they can stay? And then for those families that are in this um, situation where they might need relocation assistance or they have a one-time event where it's putting a strain and could potentially put them on a path where um, if they're not assisted at a moment in time, they could be on a path for eviction because they couldn't afford the rent. That's a mitigation fund. So we know this is part of a larger conversation. And so I address that because in all the community uh, input sessions that we've heard, and I'll go through that in a little while, um, we have heard a lot of other comments about other things the city could be doing. And so um, there's not one root cause for displacement. Um, you heard earlier that um, there's a particular apartment that because there was public investment, now it has caused the rents to go up. But it wasn't just that, it was the fact that uh, the property was sold and the new investor is the one that uh, is raising the rents. It wasn't the original owner, but that was one of the causes. Uh, we know that housing education, if perhaps we had stronger information to share about renter rights, if we had programs that devoted more time for uh, helping our community members realize property tax exemptions are available and, and full participation. Um, if we help families understand how they could use insurance, if there's some, um, you know, the roof needed to be fixed and they could fully utilize the insurance. So there's some education. We know there's vulnerable members in our community, uh, families that live pay paycheck to paycheck. And so one instance can, can be the one that becomes the cause of displacement for them because one incident makes them fall behind and then they never catch up and eventually they're forced to move because they face eviction or they have an emergency event that's more important to take care of than the utilities. We know there are market forces at play as well. As well, We know that there's some areas that have market forces, growth, um, development, redevelopment, investment that are at play as well. And so that's something else that uh, makes an area that was 10 years ago not as attractive, uh, attractive now. And so that is another cause. We know there's investment or sometimes lack of investment that could be uh, the cause of displacement. Investment because, again, private sector um, is now interested in a particular area. And so it leads to pricing people up or lack of investment when we have deterioration of uh, rental units or deterioration of even a single family home and that leads to a code enforcement action because we end up with a dwelling, a home that is not safe. And so we, it, it would be unconscionable to have that. Um, and so the effects, what we hear, what we see is that there's redevelopment of affordable housing sites, there's code violations, so now we have to do something there's the tax and rent increases, and we heard a lot in our public uh, meetings about that. Or, um, you know, someone complains about apartments not being fixed, and there could be potential retaliation by landlords. So these are the things we see and the kind of things that happen. But there's not one root cause always. It's not always A causes B. It could be A causes B, C, and D, and therefore family has to move. It could be a combination of things. Um, it's It could be one thing or it could be a combination of things. And so I go through that because that's a lot of what we heard. 
So again, these are some of the causes of displacement. We heard a lot of this feedback in the one-on-one -on -one conversations, in the meetings with those stakeholders, as well as the five community meetings. And here's some examples of that. You know, market forces could be property valuations are increasing. It could be investment in neighborhood amenities that now make an area, yes, they do make an area more attractive. Could be um, crime rates in a particular area make an area unattractive for people. Uh, or it could be the poverty of a family just does not allow them to have other options. And so those are some of the things that, that we heard um, as we were having this conversation. Would you please? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so that pause I used to recognize our city manager, Eric Walsh, just walked in. Thank you for being here. I told you there's a high level of attention to this issue. Um, so here's, here's proof of that. Um, thank you for being here. So um, I'll go ahead and continue um, that we have heard of potential additional policies that could be considered, other things we should be looking at to have citywide displacement prevention. We heard about having tax relief. We heard about making sure we have a strong coordinated housing system that helps uh, folks be able to navigate if they are facing um, these hard situations, making sure we have enough housing rehabilitation programs so that we can keep families in their home for a longer time, preserve the housing stock. Um, and, and these are some of the things we're thinking about as well. Um, so for the property tax relief, we are working uh, already. Uh, we haven't briefed you on that, but we're working at the state level with um, State Representative Bernal on the tax bill that looks at legacy homes. We're continuing those conversations. So that's something in the works, but it will be at the legislative level. Uh, we do have the coordinated housing system underway. We've only had one meeting planning a second one, so that's work that's underway. Um, we have uh, allocated funding for the uh, housing rehabilitation and preservation programs, big focus on that with both the owner-occupied rehab with a huge allocation, tripling the amount of money, the under one roof program that also is housing preservation. Those are underway. Uh, we're meeting our metrics when it comes to that. You've seen those reports. And so we're focusing on, on those programs for the preservation and protecting neighborhoods. Uh, we do have conversations about neighborhood empowerment zones, um, preliminary stage, and that one would help with um, property tax exemptions. Uh, but we have to make sure we, we fit into the state uh, requirements for that. So that's just to share with you some of what the city's doing, some of the conversations that we've had as we've gathered input as well, and to acknowledge that we know that, that this is a difficult uh, situation for families, that we wanna be able to utilize this uh, risk mitigation fund to help those families with the most need, that we wanna be able to provide the services in that compassionate manner, um, because we understand this is a highly stressful situation. Um, and so we want to talk about who this policy is for. This policy is focused on residents with low and moderate incomes who are facing displacement because there's redevelopment of the site, because there's a code enforcement action pending against the property owner of that site, or they are facing a, a rent increase that is just not out affordable, uh, affordable for them. Uh, we're looking at families who are vulnerable to displacement because they have job or wage instability, because they have lost wages, because they have a, a medical uh, issue that they have to address, or they have a major unexpected expense that doesn't allow them to, if they're living paycheck to paycheck, take care uh, of those issues. So this policy, again, intended to assist people facing imminent displacement. It help us, helps us create a standardized and efficient program where we're clear from the beginning what the assistance level is, what the rules are, um, so we don't have the, how come they got more than I did, how come someone got treated differently than I did scenario. It ensures those that um, are facing displacement can be relocated to safe, decent, and sanitary homes. Uh, again, 
having that compassion and realizing that we have to help these families in this tough situation find that safe, decent, and sanitary home. Um, as, as was mentioned in, in the note from the mayor, um, it allows us to have flexibility with how we use money um, or funds because most of the programs we have now are federal funds and they have many limitations and stipulations. So the general fund, uh, $1 million risk mitigation fund, is more flexible because it's not federal money. Um, this policy by itself will not stop displacement. Um, this policy by itself will not uh, address the negative impacts of what people call gentrification. This policy is not going to help us create or preserve affordable housing. Um, it's not going to address property taxes, nor will it house the homeless population. All of those issues are also what we heard, but this policy is not about that. This policy is for those people facing displacement that they have to relocate now, facing that emergency condition now. Um, and so we want to be able to address those other issues as well, but our charge was come up with a policy by which we do we utilize this money. We could have uh, started talking and addressing all those other issues. Um, I mentioned early on that this is in the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. It's not the only policy, it's not the only approach, it's not the only mention of displacement in the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force report in our Housing Policy Framework. Um, we use that Mayor's um, Housing Policy Task Force to build our affordable business plan that's part of our budget. And in that budget and three-year plan, which we all have as a housing commission, you know that there's different policies by quarter that we are addressing. And you know some of the deliverables by quarter. Um, there's a lot to do in this first year. Um, we could shift our resources because it really was in 2020 that we were going to look at the larger displacement prevention strategy um, starting through the end of this fiscal year, but really having a deliverable um, in 2020. But that means we have to shift some of the things in our business plan. And so that means redirecting our resources to look at the larger question. Again, there's a high level of interest. We've heard from a lot of folks about that. Um, but here's things that we would have to say, let's delay or let's wait until 2020 if we do want to shift the priorities or shift the deliverables. We could delay the buy right zoning, which is starting to gear up. Um, that's something we had looked at as potentially focusing on production. And our business plan really focused on production, uh, creating more affordable housing. We could delay uh, addressing how we could have fee exemptions for affordable housing. Again, another big item that was really focused on producing more affordable housing in the community. Um, we could delay part of the coordinated housing deliverables, not the meetings, not convening um, the providers um, within the coordinated housing system, but delaying the accountability dashboard. That's part of what we wanted to deliver this first year. Um, we could also not focus as much on the annual report. That's part of your charge. I mean, uh, that, that's something we could do because staff resources are devoted to that. We could look at um, redirecting funding that has been allocated for current programs and hire a consultant to help us. You know, this is one staff member having to do a procurement process and overseeing a consultant, but it wouldn't take more than two or three staff. Um, but there are things we have to deliver to you now. The risk mitigation policy is one of them. These are other things that are in our first year. We could delay them. Uh, and redirect resources, but these are options. So, two dedicated staff are uh, starting work on the by right zoning, um, and this was supposed to be completed by the end of fiscal year 2020, and this was addressing zoning code. Um, we could have those two dedicated staff focus on prevention. For the fee exemptions, um, again, two dedicated staff. We're going to work on this and have by the first quarter of fiscal year 2020 something to bring forward um, so that it would be um, more feasible to have more affordable housing. We have that. Again, three dedicated staff are part of this and we could um, not work on the dashboard, um, perhaps delay the annual report or do something briefer 
and we have three dedicated staff that could address all those other questions. Or finally, again, the option of uh, redirecting some of the funding for our program, perhaps the program where we're struggling a little bit more, um, reallocate some of that funding for uh, the items that were focused on production and have a staff member uh, manage the consultant and develop uh, a wider displacement prevention strategy uh, as well. Um, so that's just to say it's something we can do. We have a lot of deliverables for you this year, um, but if you want us to shift priorities, we're, we're happy to take a recommendation as to what we should focus on. Um, if you want us to look at the larger strategy. Um, we started this work before the Housing Commission was reconvened, um, even before the fiscal year started, because at the um, Housing Summit, the Mayor's Housing Summit, in, in before October 1, we started the conversation about proposing the risk mitigation fund and how to utilize that. So we started sessions then. Since the start of the fiscal year, we have had a series of community meetings. We had a, a wide community service with stakeholders who uh, participated, but also their clients participated in a lot of stakeholder meetings. Um, we even had one-on-one -on -one conversations with advocates, um, everyone from TOPS um, to, to uh, Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, um, and, and have continued that outreach. Um, we have gone to the Comprehensive Planning Committee numerous times. Here we are in front of you. Um, we had hoped we could go to council this month, but we're eager to hear your feedback. Um, and so uh, implementation, that is utilization of the fund, would be um, in April. So we could start assisting those folks who today are facing this, this very difficult condition. So let me walk through what we are proposing. The risk mitigation fund policy proposes that we have most of the money for resident relocation assistance, portion of it for emergency assistance, and then a small piece of it for the rental incentive fund partnership. The resident relocation assistance is again, when someone is in that difficult situation where it's untenable for them to stay where they're at to help them move. Um, and so it's unafford unaffordable rent increases, there's redevelopment or health and safety concerns. The emergency assistance is that one incident that occurs that puts the family on a path to potentially be evicted, to potentially be homeless, and this really helps to keep that family where they are. So keeping families out of that emergency situation, both for renters and homeowners. And this is providing assistance for rent and utilities, whereas the resident relocation assistance is the deposit and two months rent. The rental incentive fund partnership is um, to work to see if certain uh, landlords would open up units that they would not normally make available for what they consider at-risk renters. And so that's an incentive to potentially have more units available throughout the city that currently uh, landlords are reluctant to utilize for someone they consider high risk. If someone has an eviction on their record, that family is considered a high risk tenant. Um, and, and our goal is to have our housing navigators within our fair housing team and our fair housing uh, managers here help these families and offer that assistance. So we have a set of experienced case managers who work with each family individually. We evaluate the condition of the resident, um, who do the paperwork to have direct payments made to vendors. You know, the landlord, for example, if they're paying the deposit with a rent for two months. They meet with them on site. Um, they, they go to their apartments. They go to a coffee shop uh, across the street uh, in their neighborhood. Um, so that we don't force people to come down and visit with us. We also do fair housing education if there are fair housing issues to address. And then they also know who all the other support services providers are so they can make appropriate referrals. If we happen to find out that a family may also qualify for uh, pre-K, we make sure we make that referral. 
if we know that there's a food pantry nearby, we make those referrals. And so our fair housing staff who are experienced case managers work one on one with each family. And we don't make the family come to us, we go to them. And so that's the kind of service that would be provided through the risk mitigation fund. So the resident relocation assistance program is for uh, families who are renters or mobile homeowners. We are looking at assisting families who earn up to 100% of the area median income on a sliding scale since we want most of the assistance to be for lower income families. Um, we would have uh, enough notice to vacate because we know it's a very difficult and stressful situation to be in. And so uh, more than typical notice um, to vacate. The city would pay the relocation cost and of course housing counseling would be provided. Um, I mentioned we're looking at 100% AMI. Uh, but this is for residents within the city limits of San Antonio. Um, it's folks who are leasing an apartment or a mobile home. And again, if there's redevelopment, code enforcement action, that's when, that's the trigger for this assistance. And of course, we would want to make sure that those families are not receiving other federal relocation assistance. Um, and then the eligibility guidelines are here. Um, again, the scale approach in terms of assistance with the most assistance provided at families with lower incomes. Um, we know that a rent increase of 5% for a family at or below 60% AMI could be the difference between them staying or not. Whereas a family who makes slightly more, you know, 80 to 100%, 81 to 100% AMI um, may be able to bear a 5% um, increase, um, but maybe over 10% may not be something that they can afford. And so that's the scaling impact that you see in front of you. Um, and so the those rent increases are what would trigger this assistance. Here are the limits because I talked about consistency so people always know what is going to be made available and so that no one can say, well, they got more than I did. So standardizing that uh, for both multifamily um, renters and those who reside in mobile home parks. And all of these numbers are based on the actual figures we have from our fair, ho fair housing staff, where we averaged out how much assistance is needed um, to, to do this work. Um, and then for the short term, give you one slide. Um, the resident relocation assistance, again, we partner with our city departments. And if there are developments that are getting incentives, um, we are making sure that we revise the policies. It started with the CHIP policy where there's a provision where if a developer is seeking those incentives, if they're doing, if they're displacing families, um, they're not eligible for the incentive. Our housing bond has a similar provision where we can't use the housing bond funding if there's gonna be displacement, so we can't displace. And so these are additional incentives where that language would be folded into, into the programs as well, so that there's no direct displacement for these incentive programs. Then moving on to the short-term rental assistance. Again, this is uh, folks who are looking at a one-time emergency situation, looking at families up to 100% AMI, and here are the limits. Rent and utility assistance um, for up to three months. And again, you know, the standard um, as to how much would be provided. Um, looking at residents within the San Antonio city, city limits and those experiencing a temporary hardship. And again, this is to keep families housed so they don't have to move. Um, counseling and referrals would also be provided. Here's the scaled approach with the most assistance provided to families at or below 80% of the area median income, but being able to provide assistance to families between 81 to 100% AMI. Then the rental incentive fund, I described it uh, briefly earlier, but again, this is to make more potential units, um, especially focused on apartments available, so that landlords are able to uh, lease them out to families that are considered riskier. I mentioned we had a lot of input and a lot of conversations, five community meetings in every part of the city, 
three technical focus groups with providers who work with these families every day, stakeholder meetings with advocates who work and represent these families uh, who are very passionate about the work they do and very passionate about how we have to do a good job for these families. And then a survey um, that had uh, over 200 responses. We had meetings in every part of town to make sure families in every quadrant could participate. Um, originally, we planned on only three, but quickly we figured out we needed more. And our reach was of um, 1,700 participants through all of these sessions. Um, so we started hearing about we needed to have this risk mitigation approach in the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, that we needed to have the location assistance provided, we needed to consider emergency assistance. All the community input at all those meetings gave us looking at families up to 100% AMI, making sure we had housing navigators who did the case management, and making sure that the emergency assistance was also available for families to have that stability in the house and the home for families up to 100% AMI. And so again, this is a balance. We have the available funding, we have the priorities um, from stakeholders, we have the community need, and we know families are facing this. Um, so what we're looking for you, um, for some um, recommendations is, hopefully, and this is a staff hope and recommendation that you support the policy as drafted, so we can move forward to City Council on the 21st and can start utilizing the funds. Um, we can make minor revisions to policy. Um, if they're not major revisions, we can still try and have this before council on the 21st. But if there are substantial revisions um, that you want, uh, we may have to postpone going to city council in March. Um, but we definitely want your feedback. I know you weren't uh, seated as housing commissioners um, as we had all those public meetings. Again, but I know some of you did participate in that process. Um, and again, if you want us to take the larger beyond mitigation uh, look at the wider displacement um, prevention strategy, we can shift some items within our business plan. Our hope is that we continue with our current business plan so we can deliver the things we said we were going to deliver. Um, the option is to delay some items to move this forward, or again, we allocate funding from the current program so that we can move this work up. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I and our staff are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for allowing me the time to go through the presentation. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to also uh, thank uh, City Manager Eric Walsh for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your presence. Uh, we know that uh, this is a priority uh, for you, and so I appreciate you here. I also wanted to acknowledge that we have uh, two members from the mayor's office with us uh, tonight, uh, the chief of Policy advisor, uh, Mayor Ron Nuremberg, um, Persia, Victoria Gonzalez. Thank you both. Uh, both Nina Marisa and Victoria were um, very uh, involved with the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force and very much appreciate their continued uh, involvement. So, at this time, you know, this is really an opportunity for us to ask questions of um, Pedro and, and her team uh, with regard to the risk mitigation policy. I have um, several questions that I wanted to ask, um, but I'm going to you know, just turn it over to, to my um, colleagues on the commission. Um, but before I turn it over, I, I wanted to sort of preface um, the conversation with a little bit of background, and some of which um, Could you many of the commission can hear better. Okay. You yeah, to unfortunately. Do you want to move closer? Okay. Let, me, let me go to the microphone so that everybody can. We're going to work on these technical uh, challenges, but uh, I, I wanted to just preface uh, before we go into um, the conversation with the commission and, and uh, Q&A with the staff that, you know, the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, um, which I was a member of, um, along with uh, four other individuals, and I thought I saw Jim Bailey. Yes, there he is. Um, we, um, in the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, had an opportunity to sit down with the Housing Commission about two weeks ago 
really a, as a way of um, providing the history, the background, the thinking around um, the recommendations. And this particular <coughs> discussion today is a really crucial and important discussion for us to have. Why? Because it was one of our um, the five areas that we focused on. The, the you know five areas of focus for the task force, including protecting and preserving neighborhoods, and the really the spirit behind that was that you know we recognize that San Antonio is growing, it's changing, um, it's dynamic, um, and we want we want to embrace the change. We want to embrace um, the improvements that are happening. But we don't want it to happen at the expense of individuals that have been living in neighborhoods, uh, which we call legacy neighborhoods, for many years. So we, we basically said we need to be thoughtful. We need to think about how to proactively address um, what we know will happen, direct or indirect um, displacement. And so the task force um, put forward um, a set of um, recommendations. And I want to clarify the, the policy from the strategy. The policy that we um, recommended as a task force was a policy that was comprehensive and was looking at preventing, mitigating, and minimizing displacement. Um, really, with, I think at the, at the end of the day, the bottom line was that we don't want to see displacement. Um, however, we do know that it's happening. Um, and so how do we quickly get our arms around this? Uh, we had the example of Soapworks. We've also you know, seen what happened with Mission Trails. Um, the strategies that we outlined were, one, you know, we should take a look at property taxes and the impact that that is having. And you know, I'm glad to hear that Beto shared that uh, the city is looking at some legislative proposals that might address that. Two, we also said, you know, we know where this is happening in our city because there's a vulnerable community study that was produced by the city, well, you know, in, in partnership with a, con a contractor. So we have an idea of where this is happening, so we can try to get in front of it. Three, we have public entities that are also investing, and if they're investing, can they conduct a, an assessment, you know, to again, understand the um, implications of their investment and the impact that that's having in that um, area. Um, fourth, we said for families that are already uh, being forced to relocate or can't you know, stay um, at their you know, current sort of um, place of living, we, we need to be compassionate. We need to figure out how to help them. And so, hence, we propose the risk mitigation fund as a strategy. That's not the policy. That's a strategy. And you know, and so I, I wanted to provide that context because I'm you know really pleased to see that there has been a lot of effort on the city's part in developing the program and the fund and the guidelines. Um, but it's one component of a larger set of um, efforts that were recommended. And, you know, I recognize that the report, you know, has five broad areas, 11 policy recommendations, and 24 strategies, and there's no way possible that the city staff and the community can implement everything <coughs> at once. I recognize that. Um, but I also recognize that um, we need to make sure that we don't lose sight um, of kind of the big picture, which sometimes is the, the hard work, right, of developing that sort of comprehensive approach. So, I, you know, I'm sort of taking the liberty, um, members of, of, of the commission and my colleagues, to, to give that background because I think as we go into the, the Q&A um, and then deciding on option A, B, or C, uh, I just wanted for you to have sort of that perspective. Uh, and. And, you know, sort of consider the thinking that went into uh, the development. And it was really not just the thinking of the five of us on the task force. It was really the thinking of the community members that were involved in this process, whether through the technical working groups or through the various meetings that we had. Uh, so with that, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to open it up for uh, questions. And I apologize to people in the audience. If you are having a hard time um, hearing the conversation, 
we do encourage you to move over. Unfortunately, we don't have mics. We will make sure that we have mics for our next meeting. Um, but if you can't hear, we encourage you to, you know, to, to try to move over. And we'll do our best to speak up. Okay. Great. So who wants to go first? Uh, first of all, uh, I want to commend the staff for doing such a robust job of uh, doing outreach with respect to developing and the strategy. So, so I'd just like to learn more about what your outreach will be if the council were to adopt this strategy and said the, it could start as soon as we can. So, and we heard from citizens talking about not hearing about you know these particular programs and so forth. So what kind of outreach activity do you do this week? Sure. Um, so uh, as part of this process we have developed a very large uh, meetings with all the participants. Um, we have shaped the, the conversation and so all of them uh, are aware of the policy areas where we know um, there's those pressures, uh, whatever they may be, uh, we would do um, more outreach with our fair housing staff um, to to visit those areas. Um, and so there would be targeted mailings, um, for example, if there was soap works or go back to soap works to say now this fund is available, if there's someone who qualifies, we can do that. Um, and so not just the participants, uh, but that be part of the airport outreach. Um, we have our public information officer here who would help us make sure we had uh, enough press um, press releases so that this information goes through the different media. Uh, we have our social media platforms from the city that would help us do this, but we would focus a lot on housing providers, those who are already serving and providing support to families in need to make sure that they cross-reference, cross-refer, rather, uh, folks to us. And then our outreach, um, if we found areas, neighborhoods, um, and or um, current existing affordable housing um, developments where we need to go and do targeted outreach, we, we would do that as well. Uh, we know SoapWorks is one where we have to go back and say, now we can assist you. Um, we continue to offer assistance to, to residents there. Um, but that's part of the outreach. Um, and as people said, hey, this is a particular area where you need, need to go visit and need to schedule a meeting. Um, I would fail to mention our neighborhood association um, participants as well. So using our neighborhood engagement staff to also get the word out. Um, our department participates in housing affairs and events like that throughout the community every month. And so we would do that. Of course, all the council offices um, who would they get a lot of the calls of um, making them aware that this is in place so they can refer clients to us and help us get the word out as well. So how many people would you expect would uh, avail themselves of this program? Has there been, been any how sort of people, estimate? Or how many people would um, participate? How many people would participate? Um, we think we could help Probably about 200, 200. about 200 families. Um, it, it depends on the level of assistance and, and all of that, but about 200 families would be assisted with this. Um, is, is that estimate, I'm sorry, uh, Keith and Justin, is that estimate based upon you know emerging redevelopment opportunities where you see displacement happening? Over the next year, I was curious as it's what the, the analysis was based on. Uh, that's based on the funding levels. So I know that with our current programs, we have helped to date uh, about 150 families, um, and the funding available to help those families is around, um, I would say, about um, similar to just under the one million. Um, so, so based on past trends. Because uh, we do have some smaller pockets of money for relocation assistance, counseling, etc. So 
we have been able to assist about 150 families just in six months um, with just under a million dollars um, in other so resources. You're not saying a million dollars for 200 people? Around, yes. That's 50,000. 50,000 per family. So I think it you might want to look at that. We'll clarify that. Yeah, but around 200 families. Um, for relocation assistance, we we show the high level, but sometimes we do pay for hotel stays when we can't find an apartment unit. Um, that gets very expensive very quickly. Um, and so that's part of some of the assistance as well. I think um, this, this kind of gets to some questions that had been raised. Um, because yeah. at this point, you know, we're all just doing the best we can by estimating or projecting their best guesses based on best information we have. And so um, one of the things that, um, that I think has been um, uh, mentioned in a specific instance, but generally, um, I, um, I wonder if this can be identified as again as a pilot test entirely and evaluated to include how many people are served to what level they get served um, and um, you know because we're all doing just the best we can with what we have with our experience and since we're working toward um, I think it's, um, it's great that we're working hard, for example, having a very robust um, dashboard, you know, with great data. And I think so much of what we're experiencing is at least 30 years of not giving the proper in-depth uh, analysis of the issues and what they really cost because in a way I mean when you think about it um, uh, we funds are limited and so yes this is a big new thing that we have a million dollars for emergency assistance but clearly when you look at the numbers that's while that's a, a, an infinite increase in what we had, it, you know, we really see how limited that is in what we address. And we know you're going to address that by prevention. We know that that's going to happen. So I'm wondering if that there could be some um, really detailed analysis of um, what really happens. Um, and in the context of the uh, pilot study, um, I kept reading and going, what about this, what about that? Um, because the criteria, uh, some of it is um, a scale of percent um, uh, uh, rent increase, some of it is percent AMI, some of it, and, and some of it is you have to be 30 percent, um, you have to be cost burden, housing cost burden. But in reality, every single one of the people that this will be directed to has a completely different financial profile. And so let's say someone is, uh, it's probably not that likely, but what if someone is living in substandard housing, but they're making it by somehow with a lot of, you know, they have a large family, and under that circumstances, it's conceivable that they wouldn't be 30% cost burden if they're in a, you know, if they are living in a place that has been uh, um, inherited, you know, with the, um, you know, mortgage paid, obviously, their taxes, but but it's conceivable that there's a variation that makes either any of these particular criteria um, uh, difficult to surmount, yet a person could be in a great, 
amount of meat. And so um, I, I don't know how to do this. I'm asking if it's possible, you know, maybe to look at a couple of things. One, the criteria established, and two, establishing a point system for eligibility. As similar to our contract, we have certain points um, assigned when people evaluate um, contract proposals. And, you know, you get certain points for being, you know, woman and minority owned or being located. So is there a way to provide points for this, you know, being within this percent of um, rate increase? Because, I mean, for some people, a zero percent increase is going to send them over the edge. So. Yeah, I was going to just sort of um been on what you, you're proposing, um, Marianne, and I, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the charge of the Housing Commission is to provide um, oversight and um, to, to help with um, tracking sort of our progress with regard to the implementation and also um, sharing that publicly, but also like learning from how things are being implemented, implemented and, uh, you know, course correcting or adjusting. So what I'm hearing you say is that maybe one sort of way of looking at this is, so there's you know, a million dollars that um, the council has allocated to implement a risk mitigation, really a, a relocation plan that potentially could serve up to 200 people, which is a very small group or small number if you think about you know um, the, the size of our city. But then maybe we go into this with Let's implement based on the guidelines that have already been developed, but let's look at them, let's monitor and track carefully from a staff perspective, and then come back and maybe make some adjustments, you know, because this is this is not something that most cities have, so there's, it's not like we can just look to another city and say we're going to copy what they have. We're sort of creating something that is um, responsive and that's unique and it's based on you know kind of our own sort of local challenges um, so the idea of pilot to me is sort of a reminder of our charge as a housing commission which is to track these things and to be able to come back and say hey we you know we serve um, 200 people but um, along the way we realized that this population wasn't really able to access or whatever that you know that that may be and it gives us an opportunity to be able to to make some recommendations on changes that can can be um, can lead to maybe further improving the program or the plan. Yeah. So, I guess from a staff perspective, does that that makes sense? I mean, in many ways, the whole risk mitigation fund is a pilot, um, yeah. and our department, the whole city, is committed to that continuous improvement. So, if there are ways that we can improve something, well, of course we can always look at that. Or if we missed something, you know, it may not be obvious now, but as we see clients, it will be, become obvious. We're always committed to that improvement. Okay. Jessica? Um, my name is Jessica Guerrero, and let me know if I'm not speaking loud enough at the moment that you don't hear me so that I can go back up in volume, please. Um, thank you uh, for putting this together, and thank you for putting this meeting together at late notice um, that it was because um, it is important that this group uh, take a look, a deep look at this policy specifically because it's you know very at the most minimum part of our charge. So I'm glad that we're you know able to really deliberately and honestly check that off <laughs> before it goes to council. I want to request that um, I'm assuming and hoping that detailed notes on our feedback are, um, you know, uh, being uh, taken today, and that some of that is shared in your proposal to City Council. Um, I would like to hear more than we we ran this through Housing Commission. Um, I don't know today if we're going to decide yay or nay, if we love it or hate it or not. But despite you know whether we we give a, a final um, collective. Uh, perspective on that, I would like for City Council to hear more detail about our insight. Um, and I wanted to add to what uh, Marianne was suggesting right now or proposing. <clears throat> um, just one thing to note 
is that Soper Civic Health Center started off at about um, 300 or so units, um, roughly 300, 381. 381 units, <laughs> um, roughly uh, about 200, maybe 250 um, units might be still um, inhabited by the original, not original, by tenants that were there when all of the renovation and the new ownership started to happen. So um, I just want to make sure that that is considered as you're considering this um, pilot idea for what would make the best sense and be the most supportive to about 200 families in San Antonio that are currently facing imminent displacement. Um, I think that would be a great example. Are you, are you suggesting that we limit? Because, um, not that we limit, but that we start there in a very, um, that we prioritize outreach efforts there and really make sure that we go way beyond a mail out or um, a general call that Soapworks and Town Center tenants are specifically targeted to make sure that they are aware because we know it's, it's generally acknowledged that there is a need there. And not only because it's generally acknowledged that there's a need there, but because um, the need there is due to a public-private investment, as, as you stated, as one of the root causes. And I know and fully understand that this policy is not, you know, the purpose is not to address those root policies, but I think we all love effective multitasking where we can make it happen. And that would be a good way to start looking at how to, you know, to deepen our community collective understanding of what that is, of what public private investment impact really is <coughs> in our communities. Um, so it's those two reasons that I think it's important. I would just, you know, I, I, I would um, just sort of add that we have, as I said earlier, the vulnerable community study that shows a lot of other neighborhoods that are impacted. But I, I agree with your, with your point that there has to be much more sort of focus on community outreach, education, and kind of going where we know that this is an issue. Um, so, you know, kind of doing really our best, even if we don't have all the resources to take inventory, to, to try to better, to get a better idea of like the impact that this is having. Because um, 200 is not going to go very far, but and if it's if we're, if we're going to um, kind of learn from this, we would want to do that. Um, we would want to do it as, as, to cover as much of an area as possible. But I, but I understand your point about making sure that we you know we don't neglect places that are already experiencing this place. And uh, if I may, you know, we can certainly do that. Uh, but we know the need is throughout the city. Um, the the just this last month, uh, we had an example within Council District 10 where we had a code enforcement action um, for families to have to be relocated. Um, so it would not have shown up in the vulnerable community studies. It's in Council District 10, 51 families in an apartment complex because code enforcement um, issues caused by the landlord um, forced us to have to assist families there and so it, it's not limited to that and those 51 families would have been living without any utilities had we not stepped in and, and our fair housing staff offered that so so the need is not just uh, in those areas we certainly understand uh, but that was just last month um, where we helped 51 families relocate and had our fair housing uh, staff provide case management services Thanks, Madam Chair. I also want to echo a lot of my associates' uh, earlier explanations of, or acknowledgement of the mayor's office, who continues to shine the light on housing issues and how important they are. I want to thank Peter and I want to thank Eric for their attendance and for all city staff's work in pr producing this. It, it takes a lot of work to do this. I have a couple questions, if, if you allow me. Um, the way I read this, it most, mostly focuses on large-scale multifamily displacement. I'm curious, was there consideration for, you know, emerging neighborhoods and, and single family units that will see a drastic increase in their rent, all right? And, you know, I think we all know what some of those neighborhoods are based upon the investment that's going on in those neighborhoods now, where there's a large scale 
of uh, single family rental properties in that. Uh, and I was curious if there was a perspective there. And then to get way into the weeds, I noticed in the relocation assistance, there's discussion about um, paying some outstanding utility debt that's associated with that. I was curious, is there a timeline on that? Because someone could accumulate a fair amount of utility debt and all onto themselves before we even get into the relocation. Is there a 30 day, a 60 day look back on that debt? Or I was wondering if there's any consideration there as well. So those, those would be my two questions. So it talks about renters. Um, it's not just multifamily um, because we know families rent houses as well. Um, so if they've met the criteria, they too could be eligible. Um, but most of our renters are in multifamily. And, um, but it's not limited to a multifamily renter. Um, it could be someone renting. Um, we, with regards to timeline and utility debt, um, that's mostly the emergency assistance. So there has to be a triggering circumstance in, in that family's um, um, life. That, that does that. And so it's not paying back utility, but rather there's one instance and the support we provide is to pay the utility assistance. So it's not, or they haven't been able to pay for many months, it's rather there's one triggering effect or one triggering um, action within that family's um, life that now causes them to not be able to pay the utility. And so the assistance is just that. So it's not about about the other scenario that I think you described. Uh, we're going to go back to Jessica. Thank you. I just had a, a few points um, for now regarding this kind of uh, part of the conversation. Um, can you talk about the various um, types of funding that are currently available for relocation assistance or emergency assistance? Because this is not the only. Um, funding available, and that should help us understand what 200 fam potentially uh, serving 200 families with this policy would mean, in addition to other um, services available. And um, I also wanted to bring up, you know, the need for um, as far as looking at standards of quality of service in this policy. Right, we're not just trying to um, placate. Uh, an outcry. We want to make sure that we're actually addressing displacement in our communities. And in order for that to happen, um, I think there needs to be a really uh, respectful and thoughtful approach, not only to how this policy is informed and put together, which the, you know there's been a lot of discussion about that, but also how it's evaluated and how its effectiveness is, you know, studied and, um, uh, you know, considered. Um, throughout the policy, I don't see any mention of um, housing navigators working to create a collaborative, you know, relationship with the people, the heads of household that they're working with, who are going through this hugely traumatic experience of having to move outside of, of their schedule or preference, right? And um, uh, I also, um, oh, I was also wondering how many um, housing navigators or is it housing navigators um, that are the people that are uh, working with the heads of households looking for these services? How many are there? How many of those positions are funded by uh, this one million dollars, or you know, the funding beyond that that most recently uh, was allocated for housing? Sure. So um, the current funding sources we use CDPG funding for our fair housing staff. And some of that goes to direct services. Um, so it pays for staff as well as direct services. And that's CDBG Fair Housing Funding. It's part of our annual action plan. Um, and so we set aside some money for that. We use uh, ESG, the federal program, Emergency Solutions Grant Funding, um, to help make sure it's, it's mostly for homeless prevention. And there's some direct services there too. And so we use a portion of our ESG federal grant for that. 
when you say direct services, is that what this policy is? Yes, is because it, yes, it's direct services because it's assistance uh, to a family. Even though the money is not given to a family, it's assistance to them. So direct services is that. Uh, so ESG pays for staff as well as direct services. Um, so those are two. We have the CPBG funded short term rental assistance program. All $100,000 of that goes to direct services. No staff uh, is paid for that. Um, so those are the federal resources. Oh, an additional one, we have a very small grant, about $26,000, that goes to fair housing education, so that's the counseling services. That one we use uh, for promotion, flyers, marketing information, so printouts um, that we, we utilize when we do case management and offer fair housing counseling, so that's a small grant. Those are the federal resources. The general Can you question, speak up, please? Oh, <laughs> yes, sir, sorry. Um, and I'm sorry, and how many employees are you I was, well, there's so well to get there. That's the reason why I'm asking how many employees yes. are you have. The first part of, um, the first part of Jessica's question was the funding. The second part was the staff. So I'll get to that. Um, so those are the federal resources that we utilize. Um, then for general funded, um, the Development Services Department has a boarding home uh, fund that we utilize as well. Um, it's, um, it's about 100000 for them. Um, and so we have that available to also offer direct services, no staff. And then there's another $100,000 um, that's also out of the general fund. Um, the staff is mostly paid out of grants. There's eight staff in total, and only uh, one, one and a half staff is general fund. Is it just one? Three. Three, three staff are general fund. All the other eight staff, uh, or rather the total eight staff, all the other staff are funded through federal resources. So it's the ESG or the CPPG uh, fair housing funding that pays for the staff. The $1 million, all of it is direct services, not, not one penny is for staff. You basically, look at, you are working with existing staff, five yes. and, and one of the positions was a new position added um, that is a housing navigator. So the other positions were existing, so they already had a title like community service specialist, but they provide housing navigation services. The new position created was a housing navigator position, um, and so that was a new position creating the budget out of the general fund. Uh, we didn't have that position before, but it's not the risk mitigation fund. Uh, just so for clarification, uh, uh, the amount of the million dollars is going towards staff. No. It's all in the program. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, I'll probably jump back and forth, and I apologize for that. Um, getting back to the emergency assistance benefits, um, and it's probably just incredibly obvious, and I just am not getting it. Um, I was wondering why homeowners don't get uh, financial assistance to, you know, that they could apply to. Um, they're all they're getting is utilities or funds to cover utilities. And what about mortgage payments? No, it is a mortgage as well. It's it's a mortgage for utilities. So I'm so where do I see that? Because on emergency assistance benefits. Uh, can I have, uh, have yes, uh, you're not the first one to tell us that. Um, we've looked at best practices across the country, um, so we started off with that only providing utility assistance, oh. uh, but we have expanded it to mortgage. It's just not in the most updated version of the policy. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then another thing um, I just wanted to, just for my clarification again, uh, to look at sources of funding. So, and it's related to the um, utility support. Um, is this also coming from the million dollars, or is this from the programs that CPS and SAWS have? The, um, 
the emergency assistance or, you know. The ESG that I mentioned? Pardon? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was just the, so the, we have utilities assistance for emergency assistance benefits. Um, that, that's that, from the risk mitigation, the $1 million. The $1 million, and so anything yes. else can be coordinated or they can see if they have additional support they can get from CPA. Okay. Okay. Um, and I also, um, you know, I, I'm just really kind of a difficult person, and I really need to chime in again with the um, commission colleagues that I really do appreciate the work that you've put into this. This is, you know, a first time um, program. It's an innovative program. It's something we haven't had. I understand it's not, you know, it's like, like you're balancing. Like you said, we could go long term, we could go short term, and we're sort of needing to, um, you know, just because this is short term and it's not addressing prevention doesn't mean it's not addressed. So there's an immediate need among people, and I appreciate that, in a sense, since this money did not exist anywhere else, um, and we have people in need right now, um, I can understand and I can value the choice to develop this as quickly as possible. Um, but at the same time, we want to get it right. Um, and there are people in need now, but we also want to get it right. It certainly gives some flexibility if this is considered a pilot or a term limited policy that will be reviewed. So no one can get things perfect at the same time, but we just do our best. And then um, this is general and not specific about the, the benefits. And you've heard this, Vero, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, our city um, has long had an issue about identifying stakeholders. There are some people or some groups who are easier to identify with, identify and communicate and reach out to in terms of stakeholders. Um, yet there are, you know, we look at the community and we think about all the people who are holding multiple jobs and who are, um, you know, don't have access to electronics, um, who don't have access to someone who happens to be active in the community to learn about things going on. And partly in relationship to, it's kind of related to the outreach itself, but this has to do with developing the risk mitigation policy, um, but everything else is that there needs to be a way of leveling the playing field when it comes to reaching and naming and identifying stakeholders. Um, yes, we have neighborhood associations. Those are, you know, the there are stakeholders who just for for the way um, you know their life has been, um, you know, designed, or they haven't grown up in a among community activists, they're stakeholders and don't know it, and they aren't approached. You know, it's the distributed thing. They're all big people like that. So, um, in some ways, kind of like uh, related to what um, Jessica said, in terms of uh, identifying the specific feedback from this commission, it's also like, rather than naming, we've seen the, this many stakeholders groups. I think it's really important, really kind of just to identify, because stakeholders has a very good, wonderful, strong bonding. You get a lot of points for reaching out to stakeholders. But um, sometimes that can be an exclusive as opposed to an inclusive issue. So I, I think that is something to possibly address with this and others and um, and efforts in the future and um, 
And I also wanted to say I do appreciate uh, a reflection of the fact that you do reach out and you do respond to public input is, you know, and part of the, I think part of the um, energy behind uh, public uh, engagement from the outside is that this at once, at one time, was named a risk mitigation and prevention policy. And you heard all, you know, at every meeting, uh, we don't see the prevention. And I, I think that um, this presentation reflects not only just saying, um, you know, fixing it by checking the box, but I think in, in a sense, you have responded to that need from the community uh, in terms of saying, okay, this is, this is not prevention. We know we're not addressing, this is not part of that policy part of the uh, framework. This is a strategy and you've acknowledged that issue and, and that kind of, um, back and forth. I, I really appreciate it. So, thank you, Marianne. Um, so I, I have you know three points. Um, one is related to public comment about property owner participation and landlord. Um, I noticed in the policy that most of the burden for qualifying is on the family that's impacted. And there's not a lot of um, sort of clear expectations in terms of the landlord and property owner. So I'd like to, uh, to see if you all could go back and take a look at that language uh, or that section and come up with additional um, additional sort of uh, expectations or requirements of property owners. Um, I heard you uh, mention, I think on slide 23, that the city already has some provisions uh, related to city fee waivers and tax abatements and teach it, but that maybe that should be called out in this um, policy or plan because it's not it, it, no it's not in there and so no one would know that hey if you are a property owner or developer and you're tapping into some of these resources here are the expectations that the city has um, so that's one point the, the second point is I'd like to better understand the timing and the schedule for the more comprehensive uh, anti-displacement uh, policy. Um, because I, you mentioned during the presentation that you're having to look at the, the, the work plan and there might be some implications uh, if we accelerate on something, it has impact on something else. I want to understand sort of what, what is the timing on that. Um, and, and of course, you know, the Housing Commission will be um, very much involved in, in, in helping to shape that. And then the third point, um, that I'd like to sort of come back to really as a commission is we have you know three options before us. Um, we can, I think option A is we can, you know, provide um, uh, support the staff to move forward with the policy as drafted. Option B is um, we can uh, offer um, recommendations on minor revisions to the policy. Uh, and then option uh, D is if there are substantial revisions to the policy, um, it you know could delay uh, this item going to, to council. I'm sort of where I'm at, you know, as, as a chair is, um, I think that there are some revisions that need to be made, but I think there are minor revisions that my perspective is that the staff can address and make and present um, next week. Um, so I, I, I'm not hearing anything that is substantial, anything that is drastic. Um, additionally, my perspective would be that I think it's important in this plan and guidelines to, to couch it in the context of this is one strategy that is connected to a much larger effort and the city is committing, committed to doing that. But you know, we also recognize that you know, families are impacted right now and we want to be able to, to, you know, to address the issue now. Um, and, you know, we're also committed to learning from this um, initial sort of approach um, and coming back and maybe tweaking it um, based on the data, based on the analysis of this. Um, so those, those are my, my thoughts. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, 
And we'll come back if you can to, to talk about the, the, the timeline for the conference. Yeah. So, um, you have funding for about 200 participants. And, uh, and so, if the program's wildly successful, and you get 400 applicants within you know, the first month or so, it's just, I mean, it's just a first come, first serve, and when you run out, you run out. Right. Which is what we do with the current funding. All the programs I mentioned, in total, they're just over a million dollars. Remember, some of that is paid for the staff costs as well. So this would double um, the funding we have for these kinds of services. Well, I'm not recommending this, but I would offer it as a consideration that you have potentially some sort of uh, contingency fund or whatever, you know, I think that the first uh, strategy in the first, it's not the first program that you're doing, certainly, but the first strategy is coming out of sort of the task force and everything can potentially be capped. You know, I don't know how many people are, maybe it'll last all year and you'll get, a, a, you know, 187 people and it'll be perfect. But my sense is that probably you're going to get many more than 200 applicants. It just seems, you know, the first program that's coming out of the task force is something that may be very limiting in terms of the participation of, uh, of, uh, of people in that program. So it's just something I offer for consideration. Okay, wouldn't that mean, though, that we would, Peter's nodding, imagine, wouldn't that mean that we would turn people away? So if we had a rush of people, we would, you're saying, tell some people uh, we're going to hold off just to make sure we have some left for the later months, and we would turn people away? Is that what you're saying? We just want to be clear. We have 200 people, and they come forward. Right. right? And then every person beyond that, you're say, no more money. Right. So you're going to turn them away. Right. Right. But he's saying if somebody comes in tomorrow, like they did in District 10, uh, we would tell them, now uh, we're gonna. Sorry, we can't help you today. Even though we have money, we want to kind of save it in case somebody else comes in later. I mean, if you get more than what you had subscribed, for, if, if you, yeah, you're estimating there's 400 people, right? Right. So let's say you get 400 people. You have no flexibility in the program right now to serve 400 or 300 or 250 people, right? Right. So there are times, right, when you have a contingency that if the program goes beyond what you had anticipated, yeah. you might be able to draw upon those funds to pay for additional services that you hadn't anticipated when the program started. I think people understand, I think people understand or, you, know, you guys are budgetary restrained, right. and we get that. But, you know, my looking at it, 200 units or 200 clients that you'd be serving is one development. You know, and, you know, I also know that the timeline of the redevelopment and the you know, the relocation efforts don't always line up with your budget year and your fiscal year. You know, so I think, you know, I, I hear Keith's concerns about the flexibility, you know, but I think he also got a balance. And I think it's a very good first step, by the way. Uh, and I think we're going to learn as a community as we go how much resources really need to be dedicated towards this. Because as San Antonio emerges and grows and more investment comes into these neighborhoods, there's going to be a larger need. So my, my gut feeling is this is somewhat of a pilot program. There's going to be more resources in the future dedicated to it. And I understand the challenge that you guys have at staff, but sometimes the timing doesn't always line up with the number and line up with the budget and the relocation of this. I'd like to say something also. I think that's, again, part of the analysis, the really um, granular analysis that's required is to identify who got served, who didn't get served. So if someone calls in, for example, and says, I would like, you know, service, and you say we don't have any money. Um, it would be helpful not only just to it's tell for sure, but to get the information about what their profile is as to whether they would have been qualified or, or, or done it. And I also um, like, um, let's see. Well, that's, I, I won't go there, but I also wanted to just mention, this has been a, a, just a little 
thing that sticks in my little side here is I'm, I'm glad that you will be reviewing the TIFs. Um, I'm glad that uh, NHSD has responsibility for them. Um, because one of the things that horrified me last year or something, um, looking at, I don't know why I was looking at TIFs, but if you look at the original documents or the formation documents of these, um, almost uniformly, right now, of course these are older documents, almost uniformly, they, they answer a question that says anticipated displacement. And I'm thinking uniformly they say no displacement is anticipated. And I think there's a lot, um, uh, a lot of careful analysis and, uh, what am I thinking? It's, again, the, the oversight. There needs to be, I think the department has an opportunity to tighten the uh, analysis, the uh, oversight of these and the recording and the and um, also just wanted to mention that I'm not sure if this has occurred, but several years ago in one of the um, year-end budget reports, it identified um, some auditing issues uh, on the TIFs or the TERS, whatever. And uh, since then, I have not been able to find any documents to know whether those have been resolved that was like in 2016 so maybe it has just as a heads up when you address tips in your review of policies that they're I think they're fertile for a lot of in-depth uh, review but I'm, I'm glad that it would be there and the other is um, Amelia had mentioned I think one of the things, I don't know if it would be identified as a linkage, and I know that's not um, uh, legal in Texas, but I think, um, you know, to acknowledge Rich Acosta, who is, I think, the king of the, uh, the incentive options for um, owners is that in addition to making sure that uh, uh, landlords, owners understand what limitations they do have if they're going to take city, uh, if they have used city um, financial support, um, is actually can, is it possible to look into incentives, at least we can't do linkages now, but can we do incentives for making them participate? You know, I don't know what kind of incentives they might be, but. Um, just a request doesn't seem strong enough to me. A combination of the care and the step. Okay, Jessica, and then Robert. Um, so I wanted to request that along with uh, the proposal for this policy, that also an outreach plan be submitted. Um, given that only 19% of the people who participated in the community input process to shape this policy have actually experienced displacement. I, I think that um, means that we need to really make sure that, um, you know, it, it indicates what a challenge it is. I mean, I am fully acknowledging that it is a huge challenge to reach people who will be most impacted by this policy. I'm not asking you to do anything easy, but I'm asking you to do it because it is a need that is acknowledged and that we have a responsibility to meet. Um, so uh, I'm, as, I'm requesting a, an outreach plan that includes, um, you know, really looking at how to reach people who will be most impacted by this policy um, and reach them to make sure that they know this policy exists, as you mentioned and to also engage them in ongoing evaluation of how this policy is going to, uh, you know, if this policy is going to succeed and to what level. Um, 
I believe that the people most impacted by the policy will be the best judge of its success. So um, if that outreach plan could include, you know, a, a, a function that also serves to collect additional data, like what people have, have brought up, that will um, evaluate the, the policy, but also give us the insight we need to continue to build on it and to understand how to best utilize that policy as part of the larger framework um, to prevent displacement. Um, I also wanted to request that a um, evaluation process um, be also proposed alongside this policy um, that would again include you know, the people most impacted doing that evaluation. And um, I just want to point out that all of this, I, all of this discussion, I think really, for me, um, you know, confirms, affirms how important it is for that high level city official um, to be, um, uh, you know, found, like for that to be a priority as far as fulfilling the rest of the framework that is ultimately going to prevent displacement and do the best to uh, mitigate its impacts. We need that high level city official that can help, you know, coordinate these efforts and also coordinate the funding because we know it's not going to take a million dollars, um, but there are, I believe, other options to, um, you know, other funding sources to leverage to make sure that this is a good, um, successful can I ask, uh, Robert, before we go to you, can I ask sort of a, uh, a question of staff? So what I'm hearing thus far is suggestions from the commission to, um, uh, to modify or enhance the, the policy as presented. Um, and so I've been sort of tracking some of those suggestions. One is, from my perspective, I think, you know, including a preamble that speaks to the spirit and how this connects to, to the larger commitment that the city has to prevent and mitigate and minimize displacement. Um, second, I've heard that it's important for us to um, include language that speaks to this is this is our first um, sort of try at you know developing um, a risk mitigation, resident relocation assistance program, and so we. It may not be perfect, but we're committed to learning from it, gathering data, and analyzing it. Um, I'm also hearing from my colleagues that it would be really important to add um, a section to the, in the policy that speaks to the commitment to um, conduct uh, intentional outreach, um, education, and that we have a good sense of where this is happening, and so that let's make sure we start there. But Let's not leave anybody out, you know. And so, is there? Is it? Um, can we do a, a more sort of comprehensive outreach campaign? You know, uh, public service announcements. You know, that kind of information to get it out. Um, then there's the fourth piece is: can we um, have more sort of robust language around property owner and landlord engagement and/or requirements to ensure that there's balance between um, the property owner and then the, the family that's impacted so that the burden is not just on the family but you know maybe there's there's a way to maybe there's a way to engage that property owner to avoid the prevention right maybe there's some incentive that the city has that would allow that property owner to say I'm not going to raise the rent you know I'm going to keep, keep that um, and I think those are the five points that I've captured thus far but I don't see those as like significant changes, and I guess my question for staff is: Are those changes that you all feel that you can make, going sort of up, uh, along the lines of providing minor revisions to the policy, and present um, to to the committee next week and to council? Well, everything I've heard except one is doable. Uh, one is more challenging, and not to say it's not doable. And that has to do with the landlord property owners. Um, so, unless we're providing um, a direct benefit or um, something where they're getting something, there's no, lack of a better word, there's no hook to get them to comply. Um, so, that would be more challenging. Um, everything else I have heard from all of you, um, we, we can do, but 
there there would be a lot of pushback um, from the development community and perhaps the uh, apartment association um, on that. Not to say we can't do the outreach, but forcing the participation and, and all of that. That's the one where I see more challenging. Maybe it's not forcing, but it's maybe, you know, because you, you mentioned that there are some programs already in place that have provisions. Uh, so maybe beginning there, like calling those out, that if a developer or property owner is seeking support for the city or X, Y, or Z, right. you know, there are some requirements, right? Right. Um, if that's already in place, you know, it's, if it, if it is in place, I think it would be helpful to cite it, you know, to address it in this policy. In those situations, it would be easier. I guess I didn't hear the caveat. Mm -hmm. um, but unless there's direct benefit they're getting, we don't have a mechanism to say you have to comply. Um, so it would take more more legwork to do it. Uh, again, it's not that it's not doable. It just would um, be more challenging to implement. But everything else I have heard, I think, can do it, the outreach plan as well, um, all of that, all the, the, the feedback from each of you, um, I think it's doable. Robert, did you? Yeah, I, I guess the thing is that, you know, we're, we're breaking ground here and we have no history uh, at all on this. And, and so what I see um, with the minor revisions that we've suggested, uh, I, I think we should move forward with it. Uh, because, as several people have said, the need is now, you know, and there, there's nothing there for them. Um, the, the one question that I have is that when we talk about the, the million dollars and everybody's saying that's 200 people, um, are we just going to say, okay, uh, you qualify and here's X amount of dollars and is everybody going to get the same amount of dollars or is it going to be based on this is all I need right now and you can get up to a certain amount? Is there um, any... Yes. All our Graphic. amounts are up to, so we cap the maximum amount. It's not to say that everyone's going to need that. Um, it could be, you know, we have up to for the mortgage, but the mortgage could be lower. Up to this amount of rent, but the rent could be lower. So these are the maximums, but it's the actuals that get paid out, if you will. So, so in effect, it could reach more yes. than 200 people. It could, okay. yes. But so we, just an estimate. about we 200, you know, we said about 200. We would be hopeful that it could reach more. This is just a small detail. I forgot one of the. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, um, on, I think it's the maybe the rental um, program where it talks about one time. And like, are we talking about one time in a lifetime or an annual? Annual. annual. And the okay. emergency assistance is one time this year. Okay, so I, that might. Help. To clarify, <laughs> so, so uh, to your point, Robert, you know, sounds like uh, option B, uh, minor revisions uh, are possible, right? Uh, and so, do we uh, do we take a vote, or, or do, is Seth expecting for us to have a motion? I'm looking at our attorney. Be willing to make a motion. been uh, moved in second. Just one additional comment that I think was raised by Jessica and I want to make sure that I uh, repeat it is that, you know, because this body is now meeting, on a, will be meeting on a regular basis, it would be helpful at least once a month for us to receive a report from staff on the implementation, uh, assuming that it, you know, it, it moves forward. Um, and really just an opportunity for us to uh, to, to see how things are moving along and to provide input. Um, and of course, you know, there are members uh, from the public that, that want to comment. They, you know, it's an opportunity for, for us to hear from them. So that first report um, should be to one of the city council would be on our outreach one, how those efforts are going. Yeah, Lourdes, we, uh, we sent you all a copy of our monthly memo for the first time uh, last Friday. Um, Did you all get that? Yeah, yes. Right, so in that memo we'll include uh, facts about this risk mitigation fund and how it's going on a monthly basis, so it'll be added to that memo. So you already got memo one, you'll get the next memo in uh, April. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's been moved in second. Um, any additional comments? Our attorneys making sure that the motion has to be clear 
um, so to capture the, the items there, so it's minor revisions to include. Um, yes, uh, my, my motion is uh, to provide minor revisions to the policies and recommend it to move forward to City Council. Yeah, we would sing with the commission going forward as, as, the, as the recommendations were made uh, by the ordinance. You're going to just make those, incorporate them into the draft policy, and look forward to present them to council? Yes. Okay. Question. Yes, yes a question. Um, I just want to bring up what I had um, requested that when it's reported to council, that it not be reported as simply a vote, yay or nay. I don't know if that needs to be stated in this or, or not. So I just wanted to. Who's requesting the, the, the money? Um, uh, the, the, who's requesting yeah, the who, funds? Yeah, what company are they from? Or, yeah. Who are y'all? Oh, this, uh, oh, city staff. the city Where's staff. city staff? Okay, we, and we're, we're trying went for to, you. you're trying to get money for no, the no. people, for housing, no. for no. different services? No. Oh, let, me, let me just sort of clarify. I, 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 and we don't normally, I mean, you know, we have to follow um, Robert's rules of order, but I will uh, just clarify this point and we'll come back to the vote. So this is um, the, the Housing Commission um, uh, basically hearing from the city staff on the creation of a policy uh, and with some guidelines to help individuals that are um, either you know being forced to uh, to relocate or being displaced from their home the the funding for this program was allocated or appropriated by the city council and the, and the mayor back in october november of last october i guess september october, october of, of, of uh, 2018 and so the city staff have gone through a process of gathering input from the community to devise the policy and that's that's what we're and yeah. so it's going to help Okay, so it's been moved and second, um, and it's basically the the changes as uh, we, as summarized earlier. Is there anything else that that I missed in the summary that you all want to know? If not, um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we have a motion to proceed. Um, Will we be able to see the yes. summary yes. of the changes prior to the yes. going to the committee? We will do that. Um, and of course, once uh, this is posted, everything is posted online. Okay. It's going to get. But we'll make sure you get it. Yeah. Right. The, the city. I'm sorry, Lord. It's the city council agenda for next Thursday. This uh, item is going to city council next Thursday. So the agenda item, the agenda, and the backup material to include the briefing memo will be posted tomorrow. So in the briefing memo, we'll include these four items and make mention of tonight's meeting. And the policy will be attached to the briefing memo. So everything will be, uh, re everything that you talked about tonight will be reflected in the materials presented later tomorrow, probably around, I don't know what time, five o'clock is generally when they post the agenda. Okay. Is it possible to see it before it posts? Yeah, they can, who do you want to send it to? You? We can send it to Lourdes and get, yeah. yeah. Okay, just mindful that we have to, we do have a posting deadline, so if you want to comment, you probably have to get it then by 3 o'clock, no later then. Yeah. If you have any comments, you can come directly to the city staff. Yeah. But just be, we want to be mindful of your input, but we do have a posting deadline, so just to let you know that. So probably by 2, 3 o'clock, if you can get your comments in. Okay. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. It'll be, yeah. Okay. Um, so I know that this was not on the agenda, that um, really maybe this is for the city attorney's office, but we would like to um, to talk about the items on the agenda for our next meeting. Can we do that within the context of this meeting, or is it what what are the parameters? Yeah, so? you can bring up the general topics you would like to recognize for the next meeting or for subsequent meetings. Okay. Um, you can't get into a sort of discussion or in detail debate about the now, but you can sort of say this is the topic, this might be the information that would be relevant for that topic, and that would be sufficient. Okay. So, um, so if you have uh, any topics that you would like to propose, share those. Um, staff will take note, and then um, we'll, you know we'll work on the agenda. 
just uh, be mindful that you know we can't tackle everything in one meeting. So we're, you know we're gonna we're gonna see each other quite a bit. So we'll we'll have time. And uh, and also um, I have a, a commission member that's requested um, if at the end if there are any um, additional sort of public comments, I would like to grant you know um, the ability to hear from anyone that in the audience. Um, and and then we'll wrap up. Um, so, Marianne, I know you have yes. some suggestions. I have one. one is um, I would um, like to have as one of the uh, agenda items, thank you for sending us the um, uh, monthly report or the most recent report on the business plan, and I'd like to be able to have dialogue and discussion about that as one of the items. And. Um, also, um, I, I would like to talk about the possibility of being able to um, have maybe regular art, more frequent meetings in a way that's still complying, not with, that doesn't require that, but it would be optional because a lot of us are uh, thinking about this all the time in a way that would be compliant with uh, Texas Open Meeting Act, that maybe there could be an ongoing meeting possibility without, uh, that people would know about it, it can be posted for the public to attend, but it would be uh, no votes, just discussion, especially in terms of planning what are the priorities between now and especially the end of May because of the short terms we have. Um, and, um, and maybe a discussion on an update of the walking quorum because of the recent uh, court case on, um, on the Texas Open Meetings Act, which, which could reduce, which could eliminate the need for an ongoing meeting. But uh, in terms of right now, the walking quorum provision has been overturned. And is there, um, is that an opportunity for us to communicate with one another in between meetings without requiring? Uh, Say that again, so I'm to make sure. Yes. Say yeah, well, uh, essentially, I think what you're really asking for is to have regular quorum sessions. Well, I where, it, where it's, it's briefing and presentation, but not necessarily a requirement of action. Yeah, not by the body. Right. So I, I think that's something we can we can look into and we can report back out about possibilities for how we structure that. Yeah, so. yeah, thank you. But but I do want to ask us what's your advice on the fact that the walking quorum uh, provision yeah. has been overturned? The, the criminal aspect the of that criminal. has been overturned. Okay. My recommendation is still going don't to do be okay. don't, do <laughs> don't, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Jessica? Um, my uh, request for um, agenda items would be to hear on the status of amendments to the consolidated plan um, and to also um, hear uh, from Saha on the status of your, I guess, development plan or some um, shifts in the in new housing development plan. I don't know what the name for that plan is, but... RSF management plan. Sure. <laughs> um, but what's related to public-private um, partnerships and um, new housing developments coming up? Happy to provide an update. And um, thank you. And also, um, may I ask? When you say consolidated plan, you're talking about HUD? Yes. The annual action comprehensive. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Come. Consolidated plan is every five years. And election plan is every year. Which one is the one that the amendments right now? There's public comment. It's the right now. annual election plan. Annual election plan. Okay. 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 Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also, if we could um, also discuss the uh, the proposed potential changes that that staff. Um, shared with us today, I, I would like for us to discuss what, you know, what we think on that or, or what on the possibility, yeah, yes, plan. for the, no, I'm sorry, for the business, the affordable business plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any other 
items to add to the um, agenda? Okay. Um, being on, um, I do want to recognize uh, Chrissy McCain from uh, District 1. Thank you for being here. And um, do we have any members of the audience that want to uh, comment? I know we started at the beginning. We do. Okay, we have one individual. So. Yeah, in, in regards to... Can you, can, can you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, your name, and what you yeah, I'm Sam. I live in District 1, Sam Woody. Um, in regards to outreach, I think it would be good to, like, any time an eviction court case is filed with the county, y'all could be notified of that, and that could trigger education on this fund for these families that are going to go through this eviction process. Because they, many of them go in without a lawyer and they have no chance. So that's a, that's a person who's at high risk of being displaced. And y'all can take the burden off of them to find you and contact them even the show up for the court case. Like you know where they'll be. Thank you. And yes. Um, as far as the, uh, the funding concerned, can, can you uh, your oh, name on district? Sorry. Yeah, uh, Cynthia Colasso, district five. <coughs> district five. Okay. Um, as far as the funding is concerned, um, is it going to include uh, Cap North, South, East, and West? Is the funding going to go towards that for? the people of the city of San Antonio. I know that's the minority level, and I know because this funding is going to be for everybody, is it going to be um, incorporated within those areas? So during public comment, we can um, answer your questions, but the staff will be here after the meeting, and so I would recommend that you talk to the staff. And they, they should be able to answer your questions. Thank you. Yes. Cosina uh, Paula, Association, Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition. Um, I'm a landlord and I'm also a housing, affordable housing advocate, so I straddle that fence. And I, I, I would like to turn the mention an option on the landlord requirement um, idea. We often talk about <clears throat> somehow, I'm, I, I would use the word even penalizing, the buyer of the property who then is displacing tenants. It is the seller of the property that has made the profit on the backs of the tenants that have lived in that property. It is the seller that knows the timing of the transaction. It is the seller, in my opinion, um, that you have a better chance of, of asking to uh, participate in a displacement fund. They walk away with the check. The buyer oftentimes has a pro forma, has a debt service, has financial limitations that can make that more difficult. And what you don't want to do is put a buyer in a situation where over time they're not able to do with the property what they wanted to and you end up with unintended consequences for closure or whatever. So I would ask that you look at what can be done to um, have a fee on the seller of the property. You take Soapworks, which is the perfect example. Uh, James Lipschutz owned that building for 30 years. His tenants were loyal to him. I know people that have lived there for 10 and 20 years. And he sold them down the river. Now, I'm being harsh in my language, but you could say that. By not letting them know, by not communicating with them, I'm going to be selling the building. Perhaps I can help you relocate, or you, you know, six months ahead of time, letting them know, letting the city know, we're going to have this coming up. So I would ask you to look at that in the reverse. Also regarding the apartment association, Hector Cardenas is up in all of these meetings, and so is Mark Ross, and they, that is a strong working relationship with the city. They can help. They should be asked, and I brought this up, as Dr. Kamal knows, in one of our working group meetings, that education, asking them to help educate their landlords. For a landlord, a vacancy, especially an eviction, is expensive. If landlords knew of resources to help their tenants get help, they would want to take advantage of that. It 
evicting a tenant is not to a landlord's advantage. That is not the business we are in. So <coughs> buying a little bit leverage on the apartment association and SABOR for that matter to, to provide this education to landlords so that it cannot be, especially as to your point, the, the single family homeowners and others, where they can help their tenants and help their tenants stay. Thank you. So uh, we have one, two more com two more public comments and then uh, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you. Um, yes, right here. Your name and district? My name is Sylvia Rodriguez and I'm from District 1 and I come from the Soap Park Apartments. And right now, I'm going to some crisis. My my lease is up in April, and they're gonna raise it a hundred dollars more than what I'm paying, and they never let me gave me a chance to look. I went to the housing, but they took me a year, to two years before I could get for seniors, and I need help. Oh, I, I don't know what to do, so that's why I'm here today to see if I can get some help. Because if not, I don't know what it, what they're gonna do because I, my check doesn't pay. This goes to the rent. So that's all I wanted to say, if I could get some help. I I'd be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sure. uh, my name is Chrissy McCain. I uh, work for Councilman Trevino. I'm the Director of City Planning and Development. Um, I just want to make a note um, that City Council is part of the public hearing process of policies like these. It is not the rubber stamp that finalizes these things. And so um, if you have thoughts, comments, ideas, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to your council members, um, to reach out to, to their staffs, and, and make sure that, um, you know, not only do we give feedback as the policy moves forward, but also that um, as the policy is implemented, because these budgets, these policies, they are reviewed on an annual basis by the city council. Uh, and every September as we move to the end of the, of the budget process and so um, I just want to make that note that you know yes it, it goes to council in a week but that does not mean that it, it there's no more chance for for public engagement or input on these policies okay. um, I'll try to be really fast okay one minute I can do one minute how many people at this table have yes. been displaced before I guess I was going to ask how many of the audience has been displaced before. Okay. Love some work. <laughs> how many are going um, to be? <laughs> you're about to be. How many are going to be? Are you at Soapworks too? Okay. Yeah, we have several Soapworks tenants here. Um, okay. So anyway, one of the biggest problems that I've seen is that um, I've actually worked with like several people today, even who are trying to find homes. They can't find a home to begin with, and so you know, relocation assistance is great, but they can't even find a place. In the um, first place, and so that's one of the things that I think that if we had gone straight to people being displaced um, for this policy creation, then we would know stuff like that. Or, for example, there's a neighborhood at the end of the San Pedro Creek development that is all getting harassed by the developers. They won't really benefit from this either because they don't have mortgages. They've been there for you know generations, and so they own their homes. And so these are the kinds of things that I'm you know trying to talk about where we can't really create this displacement mitigation fund or policy or how to implement it efficiently and effectively and the most resourcefully with our money if we're not going directly to the people. And so it feels like we kind of um, need to do a lot of work in that regard and I kind of just want to express my discouragement that we're still just sort of sweeping soapworks under the rugs. I received an email this week of sort of a list that the city did to outreach to them and some of it was lies and then other of it was just like deceptive truths and so I think that we really need to, um, and I think that it's because we don't want to see the reality of displacement. Like we see a lot of people in this room don't know what it's like to be displaced, and the people who do um, can tell you that it's you know extremely traumatic. And I don't think that this policy addresses that in the way that it needs to. And so I hope that you know it passes. That's fine because we need something immediately. But beyond that, I hope that 
the Housing Commission continues to wonder what's going on at SoapWorks. Are they being helped and supported in the way that they should be? Because this kind of came out of SoapWorks tenants coming and kind of re-traumatizing ourselves over and over again, revealing our stories. And so I hope that you guys help the tenants there. That's all. everyone for being here. Um, our next meeting is March the 27th and it should be taking place here. Is this facility I believe on the 27th? Oh we don't have a location. Okay look we don't have a location but look out for the location. It is March the 27th. Thank you all. Thank you for the commission members. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.